righty, let's go ahead and start our meeting. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our boss series. We are delighted to have today Dr. Jessica Louts, who is Vice President of Demographics and Behavioral Insights at the National Association of Realtors. The core of her research focuses on analyzing trends for both NAR members and housing consumers. Through management of surveys, focus groups, and data analysis, she presents new and innovative ways to showcase results. Jessica discusses research findings in major media outlets and international presentations. Jessica received her doctorate of real estate from Nottingham Trent University in the UK. She also has a master's in public policy from American University and undergraduate degrees in political science and law and justice from Central Washington University. We are pleased to have Jessica back with us today. Please give her your attention. She has some great information to share with us on what's happening in real estate across the nation. So Jessica. Thank you so much for having me. I am going to share my PowerPoint. Um, hopefully, do you guys see that on your side? Cool, awesome. Um, let me go to screen that, perfect. Um, so obviously we're in a unique time. Um, it's a unique housing landscape. Um, that being said, I actually think that housing is one of the bright spots in the economy right now. Um, we are seeing that uh, home prices are continuing to increase. Um, we went into this crisis uh, with extremely limited housing inventory, and we have seen that that housing shortage has continued. People did take their homes off their market uh, temporarily, um, but what we have seen as a result is that housing demand is very strong and that's pushing up prices continually. Um, we did see that sales did drop off uh, last month. We, can, we expect that they will continue to drop off for next month. That being said, the existing home sales numbers, they're basically a backwards looking number because once it's reported, that activity has already happened. Uh, the listing and contracts to get them there have already happened. Um, so we do expect that, of course, we will see uh, this, this V down, but then we are already seeing active in the market, a lot of buyers and a lot of sellers coming back. Um, Pennsylvania is the, the state that was shut down the longest for real estate activity. And we were chatting before this um, started in full and uh, I was discussing how Pennsylvania's activity is already coming back in full. Um, there are a lot of buyers and sellers who are actually saying, you know, I live in a dense urban area. Um, I want to get out of that area, move perhaps to a rural area. So that's one of the trends that I'm going to talk about and that we're already seeing in the market. Um, what we have seen, we're doing a flash survey and we're taking regular pulse of members, um, seeing what their buying and selling activity is. Um, and what we did see uh, during the worst of the last 10 weeks, is that 60% of buyers and sellers took a pause in their transaction. That being said, that has very much uh, retreated now. We're seeing the buyers and sellers coming back. Very positive sign. Less than 10% of buyers and sellers said that they were stopping their transaction altogether. Um, so we, that is a, a very encouraging mark that uh, very few people thought that this was a, a, um, a pause that they had to take altogether, a permanent pause. Um, the buyers who are in the market are fascinating. They have absolutely put the fast forward button on. They want to get out of their current living situation, perhaps who they're living with, not entirely sure. Um, but what we have seen historically is that buyers look at about a dozen homes before they put a contract down. Last year, they looked at nine homes. So that really has to do with the housing shortage. Right now, the buyers who are putting contracts down on homes are looking at three homes. This is crazy. Um, this is like a, a TV show manifestation in real life of people really looking at very few homes before putting a contract down in their price point. Some of this is really due to the lack of inventory, especially at that affordable price point. But some of it, I think, is a behavioral change where buyers are saying, I want to make this happen if there's a second wave. I want to get into this new home. I want to move there. And I absolutely cannot stand quarantining in place being in my current home any longer. Um, the other big change that we're seeing and we have seen, and this has been a consistent number that we've seen in the market uh, over this time period, is that uh, we ask members, have you had a buyer put a contract on a home in the last week? If they had, 
how many only saw that home virtually? And it's been tiptoeing. It hasn't gotten as high as a third, but it's definitely been above a quarter for several weeks now, and it's been consistent. Uh, so that we don't have an apples to apples comparison because there's no way that we would have had a need to ask this question in the past. The only thing that we can compare this to is if we look at the profile of home buyers and sellers, recent buyers who purchased a home in the last year, only 3.5 actually put a contract down sight unseen. So this is a very interesting dynamic where people are actually still in their original homes, but they're actually putting contracts down, only seeing three homes perhaps even virtually. And what's also interesting here is that um, uh, I'm starting to hear about, and I understand this is a, something that's happening in your area as well, there's contingencies on these properties. So uh, if you don't like that home virtually, you start to see it in person, uh, you may walk away from that transaction because maybe it's not the right fit for you. Um, that is an interesting contingency that I have not heard of uh, until just a few days ago. The other thing that we're seeing is that sellers are changing their behavior as well. They're embracing all of this virtual technology, virtual tours, virtual listings, virtual open houses, um, but of course also taking the precautions of having the open doors and windows, limiting the number of people who actually come into the home um, before going through in that transaction. Um, and really something that I think is also uh, interesting that I hadn't heard of before this crisis was doing a home inspection before the home is even listed for sale so that if the buyer is only seeing that home virtually, they also have a home inspection in hand so that they really know the bones of the structure. So we started asking some questions on change and where people could be going um, and also uh, change in home features. So not surprisingly, and these seem like low numbers, but I think that the thing that I would say to that is that I suspect that they will grow over time. I have heard anecdotally that this is a growing share. And there's also pockets of this behavior. Um, so the, the home features that people are, it's now on the hot list is at least one home office. For some families, they need two home offices. I think this is a fascinating trend. Uh, this is very passe. <laughs> we did not care about the home office um, and since the invention of the laptop. So I, I think that this is something that could be here to stay as people embrace uh, working from home, remote working. Um, as people go back into white collar office jobs, they may have reduced time that's actually in the office. So if they're only there 50% of the time or they only have to go in once a week, they may not really care um, as much about their commute time because it's, it's fewer days um, and you can get more bang for your buck perhaps outside the city center. Um, that being said, uh, we're also seeing that uh, the idea of having a yard not only for exercise but also for going food. I've heard that people now want chickens. Um, people have re, uh, communities and min municipalities have uh, loosen their restrictions on having uh, chickens and goats on properties, so you could see this increasing as well. Uh, the other thing that I will dive into a little more is the change in the people who will be living in the home, but I'm gonna dive into that in the next slide. Um, and then, of course, the move away from a city center to the suburbs, small towns. Already we have seen that a quarter of younger millennials um, so 22 to 29 actually did purchase in small towns last year. Largely that's due to affordability. Um, so as we see that people not only are looking for affordability, but they're looking for more space, I think we could see the small town rural area um, growth. Uh, of course, there's always a flip side to everything and uh, affordability has uh, been that glowing point within these communities and that could be something that if there is this mass migration of wealthy city dwellers who are moving out to these areas, that of course could impact that. All of that of course depends on good Wi-Fi and enough space um, uh, for folks as well. So we have asked our members, uh, are you working with potential sellers right now? It's pent up demand that's obviously there for sellers and for buyers. And uh, the vast majority, more than 70%, are working with potential sellers right now. We ask them what they're doing with these potential sellers, um, encouraging them to get their paperwork in order to uh, uh, work on getting pre approved for mortgages and such. But the number one thing that they're doing is helping sellers DIY projects right now. 
Uh, everyone has a little more time. Even if we are back in uh, the office, even half time, we probably are not spending as much time outside of our house as we have traditionally. Um, so thinking about outdoor projects, we actually did a, an in-depth blog post on this and the spending that has increased on outdoor spaces and looking at that um, as projects to tackle. Uh, we have a remodeling impact report series and we actually have looked at the ROI on these projects and uh, for even small dollar projects that you could actually DIY yourself, thinking about shrubs and flowers and uh, having good curb appeal, you can have a return on value of uh, nearly 300% on some of these. So um, really good projects if you want to encourage your, your potential sellers to do them. So let's talk about uh, the change in home features as it relates to people. So one in six Gen Xers and younger boomers purchased a multi-generational home last year. Um, this is last year's data. And what is interesting is that when we ask our realtors right now, are you expecting that the people within the home will change? The number one um, growth potential there is to have an older adult relative come and live with that family. And so that they would need a new home to accommodate that older adult relative. This becomes very interesting because we've already seen a growth in this. We've always known that boomers were that sandwich generation taking care of older parents, kids under the age of 18, kids over the age of 18 living with them as well. Uh, so really taking care of a lot of people. Uh, Gen Xers have really embraced that theme as well. Uh, perhaps that panini generation rather than the sandwich generation, uh, updating it a little, but still taking care of a lot of people. Um, they are increasingly doing this for cost savings. So thinking about uh, everyone within that household, pitching in, paying for groceries, shipping in on utilities, and perhaps you can have a bigger home that's closer to the area that you want to live in if you can actually have multiple incomes contributing to those properties. Um, the other thing that we're hearing is that there could be a baby boom. Right now, we very much are in a baby bust situation. Um, we have more than a 35-year low in birth rates in the U.S. And when we look at this and how this relates to housing, what we see is that uh, back in the 80s, 58% of home buyers purchased a home with a kid under the age of 18 in the house. Today, it was just 35%. So if we see some uptick in this number, um, I would be a little, uh, I guess I'm a, I hesitate on this because we could see a change in this number. We could see an uptick in a baby boom coming out of this. A lot of people are at home. They now have time. They may have hesitated on deciding to have a child, and now they have the time. That being said, uh, the data that I am seeing suggests that the baby bust is really due to financial implications. So people cannot afford the $2,000 or $3,000 per month per kid for daycare. So you could see that now perhaps the kid doesn't need to go to daycare. I think that perhaps Andrew can chime in on the complication of trying to juggle having a nine month old and trying to work. Um, so I, I guess this has yet to be seen. Um, I do think that we are all in an Instapot situation where everything is percolating at a much faster rate than would traditionally happen in families and relationships and homes. And so you could see that this is not only a pent-up demand for a baby, perhaps a pent-up demand for marriage, perhaps a pent-up demand for divorce. So all of these are indicators uh, that do lead into housing and purchasing a new home to accommodate those individuals within it. The other one, on a much lighter note, um, before I joined, I had three cats who were deciding to really to kind of try and kill each other on the steps. Um, we are seeing that there is a lot of clearing of shelters around the country right now. People are adopting dogs and cats at higher rates than we have seen um, before. And uh, they want not only the companionship, but they want their kid to be entertained doing something, uh, perhaps aside from bothering them. And we are seeing that this is something that leads into home buying for unmarried couples, for single females, these growing shares of home buyers in the U.S., uh, they absolutely choose their home and decide to purchase a home because of their pets. Um, you especially see this in urban areas or rural areas, um, and it, it could be a decider. 
So for first time home buyers, what we have seen is that we have seen this growing rate of unmarried couples and for single females to be purchasing homes. And this is something that uh, could continue on. Um, that being said, we have seen unmarried couples and roommates purchasing homes often because of affordability. So pooling incomes, purchasing homes with two incomes. And as we see home prices increase, you could see that, that those shares would increase but also the impact of living alone right now um, is very difficult for a lot of individuals, especially when they're just by themselves in their place. Um, so you could see that there might be some changes here as well. First time home buyers are um, under the historical norm and they have been since the Great Recession. And that first time home buyer tax credit that pushed a lot of new first time home buyers into the market. <coughs> We uh, have seen in the recent months of the Realtors Confidence Index, which you might receive as a survey on a monthly basis, that first-time home buyers are starting to come back to the market. I am uh, a little torn on this on whether we're going to see this on an annualized basis when you look at the profile home buyers and sellers. Uh, and the reason I say that is because the credit box is tightened. And so we do know that coming into this crisis, that lenders, uh, suddenly we're saying, no, you have to have a much higher credit score, no, you have to have 20% down for a down payment, um, which is really unrealistic for first-time home buyers out there. They traditionally have not had 20% down. In fact, their traditional down payment just last year was just 6%. Um, it's always been under 10% for first-time home buyers, so you could see that this uh, could uh, have a retraction for our first-time home buyers. The other thing that we know is that millennials are being hard hit um, by this crisis, they're losing their jobs at higher rates, they're being furloughed at higher rates, um, and they, the first time home buyer right now is 33 years old. Um, and that's right down in the middle of uh, that huge millennial generation that ranges from 25-ish to about 39 years old. Um, so you could see that they are impacted during this crisis. The other thing that we're seeing, and we did a report on this actually um, as a result of that tightened credit box for JP Morgan Chase is one of those uh, lenders. Um, a third of first time home buyers actually use down payment assistance from friends or family. Um, and we did an entire report that looked at the expectations of what you need to put down versus what people actually do put down. We did find that people believe that you need a much higher down payment than what people actually do put down in real life. So I'm going to talk about some of the opportunities here that I think are, are around the corner and are building up. One of them is the tenure in home has uh, remained elevated for a number of years. People are staying in their homes for longer periods of time, nine to 10 years. Uh, traditionally, we saw people move every six to seven years as life changes happened uh, within them, within their family. So what we could be seeing is that as we're in this Instapot situation, that these life changes are now finally happening for people. And so you could see that this tenure goes down. Um, people post-recession had a hangover effect and they decided that they wanted to purchase a home that they could stay in longer. But you could see some shakeup now finally as people reevaluate where they're living and why they're living there um, and perhaps who they're living with as well. Another uh, opportunity that we could be seeing right now is student debt. So student debt is one of the biggest hurdles uh, to home ownership, especially for our first time home buyers, for millennials to purchase a home. Um, much of student loan debt going into this crisis was a negative amortization loan. And us in housing know the, the difficulty of negative amortization loans um, really is a, is a uh, is a big problem to just your credit box as you continue to make on-time payments and then you owe more the next quarter than you did this year. So 47% of student loan debt holders were actually in that situation. Going into this, uh, one of the first stimulus uh, acts that was done is that student loan debt immediately for federal student loan debt went into forbearance until October and also went to a zero interest rate. Now, you could have two sides of the coin. If you're an individual who is furloughed and lost their job during this, you absolutely should take advantage of the fact that you don't have to make these on-time payments uh, until October. The other thing that could have happened here 
is that if you luckily are still have your position and you have student loan debt, you could double down on the student loan debt because it's essentially a zero interest credit card right now and really try and tackle some of your principal of your debt. However, because this happened automatically, just like a switch that went off, if you didn't read the articles on it, you may not even know that this happened and that the money is leaving your account if you just put those on auto payment. So a lot of ifs here um, on the student loan debt box, but I could see that people might be able to tackle some of their debt right now um, if they are aware of that. Number four, the agent use is trusted. Um, so we are actually doing some surveys um, with consumers right now. And what we are seeing from consumers is that, yes, the agent use is trusted even more now than ever before. Because people really, they're, they're using these virtual tools, they're looking at homes online, but that personal connection is really something that all of us are missing and that people really want this person who will help them through this process that they can ask questions to, who is their representative through this process um, and has a good reputation. As we look at the buyer's use of agents already, we know that looking at last year's data that the use of agents is near historic highs. People do not feel comfortable going even into build, uh, to a builder's agent and saying, oh, I'm just going to buy this new built property without representation, without someone to help me through this process. They want an agent to help them through that. On the selling side, we also see that agent-assisted sell sales are near all-time highs as well. Um, people really do want uh, to sell their home in a timely manner, to be able to get the best price for their home but also to price their home competitively and market that home to consumers. Something that's very new in the data that I haven't seen before is that people are actually saying, I binge watch these TV shows on, on home buying and I like them and I know that I want my home well staged as I go into a home to purchase. So sellers are starting to look at that and actually saying, I want my agent to help me understand how to fix up my own home to sell. And again, this is one of those opportunities where we already know that agents are working with potential sellers to be able to take advantage of that time right now. One of the things that we asked in a, in a recent flash survey is about just looking at donations and volunteering and helping their local communities. We know overwhelmingly that eight and 10 of our members actually do volunteer, they donate on a local basis regularly. And so we wanted to see how many of our members are just looking at coronavirus. I started seeing all of these wonderful members posting pictures on Facebook about not only making masks and donating food, helping frontline workers, but they were also giving blood, um, which I just thought was just amazing to see all of these photos, um, just really heartwarming of our members really reaching out. Um, and I, I think this is a beautiful thing that we are seeing and the community sees it too, um, just how invested our members are. <clears throat> the one plug I wanna give, um, thank you guys for listening to all those stats, is uh, right now we have great tools right now at NAR, you can take free classes. Um, there's free telemed, um, which is amazing. Uh, and if, if you don't have health insurance, that, that really is a great opportunity to take advantage, but you can also download the profiles on buyers and sellers, which I used a lot of this data, it's completely free right now, um, as well as take classes uh, and social media guides and such. So the, this is a great opportunity to take advantage of these free resources. Also, if you're not following us on social media, um, I'm just one of the researchers in the department. There are a lot of really, really smart people in that department who are putting out really cool information um, so I do encourage you to follow along on social media because they're putting out stuff on a, on a near daily basis on our blog, um, uh, putting out great stuff on, on different ways to look at this crisis, but different ways to look at coming out of this crisis and the opportunities that our members have. Um, I am going to stop sharing my screen, but I am absolutely happy to take any questions that you guys have as well. So thank you. I'll just say, first off, you know, Jessica, what were some of the questions that may have came up um, kind of after NAR's mid-year meetings? You know, I know that you and Lawrence uh, presented a lot of information, a lot of data that if people hadn't had a chance to see you beforehand like we did with our Government Affairs Committee, 
uh, this would have been brand new information. You know, everybody's concerned about inventory, um, you know, and I think you covered a lot of that, but that seems to be the universal question around the industry right now. But what I remind people is, is that without COVID, we were talking about, we've been talking about inventory for three years now. Um, you know, do you see some of these trends where people are going to want to make these moves? There's going to be some life changes, jobs. I mean, we've got people unemployed now who three years ago weren't unemployed who might be looking to downsize, or you have people who may have to move for jobs now uh, that may have lost their job. Any thoughts there in terms of kind of movement going on that would impact inventory? Yeah, so um, there's some research out there that actually suggests that since the 1980s, so going back quite a while, um, that migration patterns have actually reduced by half. So people really stay where they grew up and they want to stay close to their family. It's really a huge draw, even for millennials. Um, really fascinating trend there to see younger millennial patterns of buying is very similar to the silent generation, so older than the boomers. Um, where they want to be close to friends and family. And this is something that we never saw for Gen Xers. We never saw it for boomers. Um, it was not a high priority for boomers and Gen Xers to buy their first home close to their parents. Um, I think that it's possible that we really could see some migration patterns open up here as people realize, I don't have to live next to the city center. I really can live a place where I, I can deal with commuting once a week, um, but I, I couldn't do this on a daily basis. You could see some patterns like that move. Um, you could see that people might really seek affordability right now, and that goes with more space as well. I, I think that the sky's the limit right now in what we are going to see. Um, and that could help the inventory crisis. That being said, the inventory crisis has really been at those affordable price points. And we have plenty of inventory at that million dollar price point, but nothing at that 200, 250 price point. So, this is where it becomes a little tough to see who's that affluent buyer who's going to move out of that city center. Well, and I think another question, you know, let's focus on um, affordable housing for just a second. You know, one of the main arguments about affordable housing is to increase density. So, I mean, you know, here we are in the era of social distancing where people are kind of like, hey, uh, 20 acres and some elbow room doesn't sound so bad, uh, especially as a lot of these people who are trying to live in urban centers for jobs, they're trying to live downtown closer to work so that they can kind of live, work and play in kind of this same environment. Well, I mean, let's look at Facebook for a second and, you know, let's also work, look at like WeWork uh, and the co-working space, you know, where a lot of independent practitioners and people who are, you know, um, independent contractors, freelancers, they're not going to, I mean, I'm not going to be going and sitting down in a room full of strangers uh, to, to use their internet, you know. So again, I'm, I think, like you said, that it's just, there's going to be some interesting transitions, but what, where do we go from here in terms of that affordable housing? Because if people are going to be flocking out to the suburbs, we know what the suburb model looks like for housing development. Right. Um, so I, I think it's, it's going to be a fascinating time. And people are going to look at home features differently within that home too. So people have traditionally looked at what's the proximity to the dog park? How soon can I get to work? And I think that now you might, might start seeing listings um, and you can actually plant your own garden. You can have chickens here if you wanted to have chickens here. And that might be become more uh, popular. Two tiny bedrooms sounds like two home offices to me. So <laughs> those are the types of things where it's suddenly something that really was a detractor and now could be a very, very good opportunity for realtors to be able to list those properties in a new and different type of well, and I, I think it's funny, you know, my, uh, my wife and I have always said we wanted to have a house with a pool, but we've never wanted to have the maintenance of a pool. Well, now when, you know, the weather's been great, it's like, I really wish we had a pool out back to, uh, to be able to enjoy. So I think you're right. I think all of a sudden things, how we market properties is going to change uh, a lot too. And it's, it's been really interesting. Uh, one of our staff here uh, their parents are moving to, to the Raleigh area to be near them. Um, and so they have gone, they went through the home buying experience this past weekend. Uh, and it was very interesting. Um, 
and her parent, one, her, her mom is a realtor from another area moving into this area. And, you know, they bought the house. They bought a house over the weekend, saw, you know, five, six, seven, eight houses, uh, and then made a decision, went through the inspection yesterday. They weren't able to be at the inspection, which was, I think, anxiety causing for everybody because, you know, you want to be able to be there and talk through those things. But, um, you know, I think another question, Jessica, to think through is what does this do in the commercial world? Um, you know, I know we talk a lot about the residential side, but from a commercial side, if I'm a leasing, you know, if my business is commercial leasing right now, am I panicking? You know, am I panicking about companies realizing that the overhead of office space is a lot of overhead? Yeah, absolutely. And that, uh, the first thing that we saw really is a major retreat from that commercial sector. Um, and it, it really did happen before the residential sector and that when people took a pause there. Um, I think that there, there could be some lingering effects here as people use office spaces less, but there could be some opportunities to retool those office spaces. Perhaps they do become the tiny condos. Um, so I, I think that, you know, we have to look at properties and in perhaps a different type of way. Uh, one of our brilliant economists came up with a case study where he looked across the country at vacant mall spaces, someplace where people used to love to go on the weekends or after school. People have seen a lot of malls around the country shutter. And so he took that approach and said, how do we use these as hospital centers right now if that actual community does need that space? So I think just rethinking how we think of properties could, could be a, a good opportunity for some sort of developer to come in and say, if this place is vacant, how can we use this? Uh, weed, marijuana is one of those topics. Uh, that, you know, gets a little morally uh, iffy there. But that being said, we've done some research on this, and we have found that demand for those empty warehouses uh, has really increased with marijuana where it is legal because you can grow and you can store the product within those empty warehouses. So just rethinking of how we can use existing structures could help some of the inventory crisis we're seeing. Very fascinating. Yeah, I've I've really wanted to know, I've really tried to study kind of what people are thinking of in terms of office space, because I think there's obviously going to be a direct correlation to residential, uh, because as, as companies, I think for forever, it's been this culture where you had to be in your desk, be in your office in order to be productive. Uh, and I think over three months now, almost three months, we have proven that employees, when managed right and good environments, good cultures, uh, can be just as productive and successful no matter where they are. Um, and so does that change this kind of these requirements of, you know, hey, I have to move to Austin to go do this job. I have to move to Raleigh to go do this job. Um, or I don't have to live in I don't have to live in Austin, so I'm going to move to Raleigh. Uh, you know, and people begin to be able to make different decisions about where they want to live because they can remote work now. Um, I think that'll be interesting. All right, one last question for me, and I swear there's other people in this chat except <laughs> besides the two of us. Um, but, um, oh, let's ask Brenda's question real quick here before I ask my last one. Has NAR added more partners that provide for the current marketing and business model more realtors are using? Yeah, so I think that some good places to check out, uh, one is the right tools right now, because we do have some good resources there, and some good marketing resources as well. Um, the first class that I think was offered under right tools right now was actually ePro, and I believe it was for free. Um, so that's that's all about the, the virtual, the new world that we're in. Um, the other thing that was, uh, that is, is always cool every year to see is the new reach partners. Um, so we partner with small uh, companies, entrepreneurs, much like realtors who are starting up and saying, how are these cool companies that can actually help realtors in their business? Um, so those, I actually had the opportunity to talk to them yesterday. Um, they are really, really smart techie people. So um, looking at new ways that realtors are transforming their business and they have done reach partners for a number of years now. So um, always cool and interesting to see them. Uh, okay, Kevin left out. Um, okay, my last question. Um, and as you know, global real estate's a big thing for us here. Um, here in Raleigh, we have a great global council that our staff and volunteers work on. Um, 
let's talk global real estate for a second because um, let's take, for example, our ambassador association, uh, India. Uh, India has been shut down. They've just been they've just been able to start getting out business. They've just been able to start getting back to work. What does this do um, for the American real estate market in countries where real estate is still slow? Um, where things aren't moving as quickly as America begins to kind of open back up and there's more opportunities, especially with some of these commercial properties potentially, what do we see on a global scale? Yeah, so this is, I think, one of the parts where it could be pretty difficult for 2020. Um, and th this could be pretty difficult. Uh, we have seen that even in 2019, we did have a slowing of the international home buying market. Um, and so we, we likely will see that continuation through 2020 as we see that a lot of countries have travel bans um, and such, and the, the international travel has significantly reduced. Um, I did read some articles, though, this morning that talked about people domestically buying vacation properties by it unseen, so you could see some of that activity. I saw your post. <laughs> I, I think it's interesting. I mean, those ho those homes in that article were gorgeous, so I had to share that. Uh, and everybody wants a beach house right now. <laughs> seriously, yes, we all want to dip our toes in our own private pool. We have the time now to have the maintenance ourselves. So, right. yeah, you know, you could see some of that activity where people are buying things sight unseen. Um, you could see more domestic travel. We've definitely seen that international travel has been very popular in recent years. So you could see more domestic travel and people buying domestic vacation homes because they could say, I can't go on a vacation for the, the time mm -hmm. being, let me go and buy this property. Um, we did a report last year that I thought was really interesting and I actually went back to the economist who worked on it and I said, no way, these numbers can't be real. Uh, some of the cabins that you can buy in really beautiful lake country um, in the Midwest are really quite affordable and some of those mortgages that she was looking at, I, I couldn't believe how affordable they could be for some people. So um, I think that there could be opportunities like that uh, that may pivot this year instead of that huge international market, you could see different domestic vacation buyers coming in. Well, and I also think, you know, I think the barrier to entry for digital real estate has been lowered significantly. Uh, I think what a lot of us for years have been saying is, you know, it's time to make that jump into new technology, into new showing practices and all these different things. However, uh, for the more traditional agent, people who've been in the business for 30, 25, 30, 35 years, it's kind of hard to say, well, listen, I've always been successful doing this face-to-face -face, uh, kind of interaction. Well, I think COVID has kind of forced everybody's hand to where in, you know, people who are sitting in this room now may not have been in a Zoom call three months ago, may not have ever heard of Zoom, but yet now we're kind of becoming second nature to a lot of this. Um, I, I think that it may open up more opportunities for that global real estate connection because again, if I don't have to be in Dubai to buy, if I don't have to be in Costa Rica to buy, uh, and I can see the pictures, the virtual walkthroughs, uh, all these different things. Um, I, I think it makes it a completely different question for investors to say, oh, I can, you know, I could go plop down in a different city and virtually tour, you know, a whole slew of properties. So it'll be interesting to see. Uh, I'm curious if we continue forward in this new way of doing business or if we decide we want to go backwards. But <laughs> I think everybody feels like they want to go forward. Yeah, absolutely. And why can't you take some of these beautiful tools that we've now all learned and take it with us as we as we do reopen? So there's there's no reason we can't take the good stuff with us, right? Absolutely. One last question, and then we'll let you go. Um, we have everybody, you know, has friends in other parts of the world that are doing business here in the country. Uh, the folks in Pennsylvania, New York, um, Washington, I think, you know, one of the things that I always like to do is put in perspective our marketplace, which has for years now been a very strong market. Uh, Raleigh is moving, uh, you know, are the research triangle is attracting a lot of people. Um, what are we seeing as New York and Pennsylvania and what was kind of the post recovery out in Washington? You know, friends in Seattle said, hey, it was dead and now it's back. You know, we're back in business. What's Pennsylvania saying? Yeah, so I have heard that Washington, California are absolutely back in business. The data that I'm seeing from them 
uh, it does show that it's really the inventory issue that's that's been the slowdown there. Um, but as a home comes on the market, really people just clamor for that for that property and make multiple offers in both of those states. Um, in Pennsylvania, we are seeing that the last week the state opened back up. Um, it really was unfortunately uh, because of the lockdown there. It was very you really couldn't do real estate business, and so that was very hard um, for realtors in that area. Now that it is coming back, what I'm hearing at least from the realtors and the research committee, they chimed in that how their state was doing. Rural areas, they're having multiple offers on properties now. Um, people are actually taking the virtual tours. They're maybe making offers that way or in person at this point. They do have to stay pretty close to their home office. Um, so there is a, a distance limitation there. I am hearing um, the contingency that uh, once you see the home in person, if are you still okay with that home? There are some buyers who are walking away. Perhaps the picture is not necessarily what they're seeing online. Right. Um, so I, I think it's encouraging that people really did have that pent up demand and they really are just like a slinky bouncing back They're they're back there. I agree. I agree. Well, listen, this, this has been great. It's always good to talk to you, Jessica. Uh, you just have such good insight and we just so appreciate the research you all do, uh, there at NAR. Um, was the, uh, was it George who was working on the, the commercial study? Was, was George the guy who was working on that? So George has actually made his way over to realtor.com. So we're a little heartbreaking now. Oh. So he's at the economist shop there. Um, so no. So it's one of our, our uh, Brandon Harden. He is a new okay. economist and we stole him out of Kansas and he is brilliant. So. <laughs> well, we, I love George. George is a brilliant guy. Always, always great to talk to George too. So we'll have to get George in here sometime. But listen, you know, if anybody has questions for you, Jessica, can they reach out to you directly over email? Uh, is that okay? Yes, absolutely. It's jlouts at realtors.org. Absolutely. Do reach out if you have any questions. If I can't answer it, I'll pass it on to someone who hopefully can. Yeah. Well, and the last thing I'll say is if, if nobody on this group has yet to go look at the study that I think Jessica and her team did, and I think they recently re-upped it and re-updated it, was the economic impact of a home sale uh, by state. Uh, when you look here in North Carolina, I believe, and I'm going to misquote this, um, but I, we posted a graphic not too long ago, uh, and I think it was maybe $70,000 that is generated per home sale here in North Carolina as a state. Um, it's important for you all to understand that. And, and Jessica said it earlier about how important the real estate market is going to be to our economic recovery. Um, all the jobs, the opportunities, everything that comes from a real estate sale, you all should feel very proud of that and what you do to the economy here. So, all right. Well, if nobody has anything else, then I guess we will call it. Uh, and Jessica, again, we appreciate you coming in today so everybody can give a virtual uh, round of applause uh, for, for Jessica. Uh, and we appreciate it. And we'll, we'll keep it going. We'll get you back at the end of the year so you can tell us uh, what's happening then. Yes, yes. It is a changing situation, that's for sure. But thank that's, you so much. Thank you all. Have a good rest of your Wednesday. Okay, thank you. Thank you.